um, at your I Care Foundation interview, you, you started off with, uh, you know, this, this statement about how you all have to step up, how uh, I'm just trying to connect the dot between, uh, you know, sustainable energy with providing solution to the pandemic, the pandemic right now. Um, you know, what can you shed a light on, it, on that? See, if you look at the pandemic, right, in the sense, what has happened? Uh, like, unfortunately, unfortunately, COVID and climate change are, are born, are, the brunt is borne by the people who are not the cause of it. Mm -hmm. That's the poor. Poor are not cause of the climate change. Poor are not cause of the disease that is that has been coming, but they are going to face the brunt for generations. See, today what is happening is we all in the lockdown, okay, we, we told all the migrants, all the workers, all the poor people to go back to their villages, right? While we are trying to lock down. As soon as the lockdown goes down, we will, many of us will refuse to take them back because we don't know whether they are going to get the COVID back to us, That's right? True. So it's a double whammy for the poor. <laughs> They're not responsible, but so for us, uh, what, what we are basically saying that this is the time where a lot of the poor people have gone back to the villages is the concept of decentralization. This is a concept of the, the, the brunt of the problems are being created because we have centralized a lot of the power systems. We have centralized electricity. We have centralized economic generation. We have, we have created urban hubs for, for, for economic generation that has lured the poor in the name of incomes. But the day the lockdown happened, we threw them like nothing, like we don't need them, right? It's mm -hmm. a an use and throw and said, you go where you want. We didn't create any safety net. We used them for their physical labor, but the moment we didn't need them, we threw them apart, right? So my question is, sustainable energy is a very powerful tool to democratize innovation, democratize entrepreneurship, and democratize in a way that it's a only one of the few things where it's a level playing field for the poor to actually take everything in his or her hands. Because can we create a radius Islands of development, 100 kilometers islands, 150 kilometers islands, 200 kilometers islands. And all these islands can be only be looked at from a sustainable energy perspective because if a, if a paddy farmer wants to do thresher, uh, thresher, for example, then what happens is that I can ha have a solar power thresher there itself and the markets can be within the 100 kilometer radius, right? So you create that whole centers of innovation. Uh, and, and sustainable energy. I want to have a health center. I don't need to get diesel. I actually don't need to have extra power. I just need a maternal labor room and operation theater that can be all powered by solar there itself. And you democratize everything, health, education, livelihoods. You so democratize the service. That is for decentralization. Completely, it's a Gandhian philosophy. So yeah, it's, it's the... Uh, the Gandhian approach, if you look at the old Gandhian approach of, of decentralization, this is where you hand over the ownership to the poor, where the poor start building the assets in a such a way that the safety nets get created, that they don't have to go through this crisis in a manner that they have nothing left to. And that's where sustainable energy plays a very powerful role. So, so what I'm hearing is when COVID-19 is over, it's not over for the poor people. This, you know, big aftermath in uh, sending them, you know, downward spiral. And see, for, for the poor, at least we have gone back by 15 to 18 years. See, for example, for us, we see that the world has gone poorer, but the problem has the disparity has increased because everybody has got poorer, but the poorer have gone much poorer. So if the, if the, if the world has gone poorer, but it has actually like this, it's much more. And that divide, as such, that was disparity in the world. But with COVID, we have increased the disparity. I mean, if you look the, if you break the poor into three parts, poor, very poor, and abject poverty, a lot of the poor and very poor have actually slipped. The rich might have got little less richer, but they're still in the rich category. But that is where I think that we have pushed back by, by a generation or one and a half years, one and a half, uh, 15 years, one and a half decades at least, that... And the danger, not a danger, if you don't create appropriate mechanisms of safety nets, you will lose another five to eight years, which means that, can you imagine if your kid was in five year, five, fifth standard, 
in six years, it's 11 standard. That means you're losing half a generation. Wow. So for us, it might be only five years, but it's not five years for the poor. So what, what can responsible leaders do right now? I think all stakeholders have to be equally responsible. Whether, see, today what happens is, unfortunately, we turn around and the biggest excuse that we do is the government has to do everything. I said as citizens, I mean, for, for, for me, the ideal, my, 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 one of my frustrations or anger, I mean, if you look at, is the day the lockdown happened, how did not big companies create appropriate social distancing mandates inside their company premises where they would have protected all the labor force and say, I'm going to provide you. Don't worry about it. You don't need to run away. How come companies for the sake of profiting or whatever you call it, immediately said, you go off. Right? Because they have no, uh, uh, what you call it, is written contracts where they can sue anybody else. We have created, I mean, such a false system. And I think this is where I would say, um, how do we come up with appropriate solutions so that that today, whether it's a government, whether it's a corporates, whether it is the, uh, the policymakers and civil society, all need to say that can we create islands of innovation? And I would say one of the, one of the things that government could do is how do we create R&D and failure money for vocational schools? If you look at the most, um, uh, the success of Europe and America in the, in the, future, in the, la in the previous decades, or the, or two, three decades, it was because of their vocational school. It's not because of the MITs and the ALs and the, it's the vocational schools that made these countries hands on. Mercedes is done by most, a lot of vocational school engineers came out, right? India's agricultural revolution happened because of the vocational schools in India, right? And we have forgotten those vocational schools, saying that who are not good in studies will go to vocational school. That's not right. They're they are all hands on brilliant. Why not we relook at grassroots level innovation, grassroots level entrepreneurship, and create us um, centers of innovation in these um, in these uh, institutions, along with creating a long-term rural financing. I'm not talking of microfinance. We need to create long-term finance for the poor to own assets. These are the two things that need to come in. And very similar to Philippines, India and Philippines, who gets the money? PowerPoint, Excel, and Word. Non-English speakers have absolutely no chance. Right, no chance to innovate, no chance because he or she who does not speak good English, who cannot give a presentation, will never get a good uh, failure money to experiment. Mm -hmm. Right, and that is what we will we are pushing for: is can we create these vocational schools as centers of excellence and rural banks as high risk capital for enterprises and innovators to innovate? Are you optimistic that the government would listen? because we are at a bank slate right now. So what's happening, fortunately, is that many of the local governments are actually desperate to get new ideas. So I have a lot of hope. See, the thing is, what happens is we come from all, I mean, any country is very always cynical about the government. But what, what you don't realize that under the in, the, in the name of the government, there are thousands of people. And out of the thousands of people, you have hundreds of champions. So let's catch hold of those champions. Let's not blanket the government as government. We are basically said, let's go after guys who are very innovative. He or she is innovative. Let's make them the champions and showcase them to other bureaucrats. And so those quite a few number are coming up. I mean, uh, the, the fortunately, or in the last whatever month, the access has so long increased to for us to, to some of the bureaucrats, it's been amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it's, it's, it's actually, um, some of the champions are actually uh, coming up to the talking about your country or are you talking about international? No, no, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, for, no, it, it, both. I think in, in India as well as a little bit of more internationally, <clears throat> uh, like Sierra Leone, for example, or parts of Ethiopia, it's what we have been focused on. Uh, but India definitely at the at the grassroots level, some of the pol policymakers and bureaucrats are more receptive. Yes.